Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Trevor Calabro. Thanks for joining me today. Um, Aaron was telling me this is most likely going to be a developer heavy type uh, session here. And that's perfect. So if you're here and you're a developer, this entire presentation is UX for non UXers. Um, and I'm going to ask that everyone kind of hold hold off their uh, their questions till the end. This is a presentation I've given numerous times and it takes around Oh, I see some familiar faces already as well. So yeah, let's uh, let's just jump ahead. So I'm going to share my screen. Tell me if I can, Aaron, if you can tell me whether it's showing up good or not. We good? Yeah, we're good. Okay, excellent. So <clears throat> yeah, this is the title, Simple Fixes for Huge uh, UX Problems. And the idea here is I've broken down my 15 plus year career in um, user experience into kind of like, if you Google, over the years, people have come to me and said like, oh, what are the UX laws that you, I, I saw UX laws on the internet, you know, some UX -y Instagram influencer came and showed this thing. And, and I want to know whether, like, what, what should I listen to, what not, blah, blah, blah. So what I did was I condensed those. If you Google it, you'll find anywhere between 25 to 30, what they call laws, UX laws. I boil them down to the things that I use every day. And by demystifying, I, I, I'm going to, give you the academic definition, but also give you my the way I think of things. And that's pretty, and some real world examples. So that's the gist. Um, before I get started, just a real quick word about Atten. So um, I am the senior user experience designer at Atten Design Group. And Atten Design Group is a, is a full uh, service technical agency that works with a lot of different um, sites at Stanford as well as many other. And we, we kind of boil down just like every other digital agency into these three buckets of stuff that we do. And these are the types of clients. So the, the two main things about Atten that kind of resonate with people are, we work with only uh, cause-based uh, organizations, which means the world's biggest nonprofits, uh, uh, higher ed is a lot of our clients, as well as, um, as, well as like local governments and stuff like cities, city, city of Raleigh, North Carolina, stuff like that. And for us, we don't differentiate. We just try to do work that matters. So it's all about our clients. And we also, the second thing you need to know about Ed is we kind of believe in this like teach a person to fish model. So everything I'm gonna talk about here today is to fast track your knowledge of UX best practices, right? That's why this is kind of like a UX talk for non-UXers. Um, arm you with some tactics that you can put into action immediately. So if you go to the page, uh, Aaron, if you could at some point uh, type in my page for this session, um, I put at the bottom, I put um, some handouts, some like PDF, uh, right in that page on the WebCamp website. And then I just, I have this framework that's like a three step, you know, everything's gotta be steps, right? So three easy steps to implement this framework. Now, if I do see some UXers on the call here, um, this, although it's kind of focused on non-UXers, I encourage you to stick around, hear me out on this and see if the way I've kind of communicate this is resonating or not. So feel free to reach out to me what could be improved, how I could do this talk differently, um, and anything that, that you think I may have missed. And I encourage you to uh, have a conversation in the chat as I go. So I am gonna try to go quick through some of these slides because I wanna give enough time for Q&A at the end. So uh, here's kind of the basic agenda. I wanna give a really brief and incomplete history because this is intended for UX for non-UXers. So I just wanna have a level playing field. We're all starting from the same kind of stuff. And by the way, Stanford's in here which I've given this numerous times and just Stanford's like, you know, I, I, it's a real honor for me to talk at this because Stanford's kind of the birthplace of the first formalized like UX curriculum uh, across the United States. So it makes me super happy. Um, then the principles, right? So these are the 30 laws or 22 laws or whatever, if you Google it, I broke it down to seven laws. And these are the seven that I use every day. Does that mean, so it's, it, this is also, it's not comprehensive. Right. So these are the ones that I think if you internalize these seven, it'll just fast track all of your uh, UX kind of uh, design methodologies. And the other ones, it's not that they're not important. These ones just hold more weight, have a higher impact and will uh, just, you know, if you, if you just do these seven first, you'll be really uh, far ahead of most of the rest of the Internet. And then the UX for you, how to put this in that three step framework that um, I'll, I will uh, go over. So before we get started, I want everyone to raise their right hand. So this is the Stanford WebCamp Oath of User-Centered Design. All right. And also go grab the closest 
uh, Steve Jobs biography. I know you all have them laying around. Yeah, that's right. Put your other hand on there, I guess. And I want you to say aloud, I, insert your name, I can see some of your video faces. So although you're on mute, let's, I, my name, will only say I'm doing user-centered design until after, there's the keyword, I watch real end users conduct real world tasks with my designs from this day forward. Okay, you can put your hands down. Now, you just took that oath and you will not be able to sleep at night if you continue to not do this and then continue in this with the rest of this uh, presentation. Okay, so I wanna give everyone an opportunity to just log off now. So our numbers, we're starting at 300 participants. Okay, 150 have left. All right, we, okay, we weeded out all the charlatans. Let's move forward. By the way, you can't go back. Once you see what you're about to see, you can't go back. Fair warning. All right, here's my brief and incomplete history. So these, I'm gonna just fast forward UX all the way to the advent of the internet. So David Kelly on the left from IDEO fame, he started the uh, D school user-centered design methodology at at Stanford, we, among many people, this is a condensed thing, right? But uh, I'll, I'll just, we'll give him full credit today. So, um, and he also in like popularized this idea, the design thinking framework. Now, if you don't, if you're not familiar with this, I'm assuming most of you are, it, there's different versions of this, but they typically have five linear buckets and this iterative cycle somewhere within it. Um, that's kind of all you have to know about this. Also, it's a great framework that we're gonna use to frame all this stuff. Uh, at the end. So, um, but Trevor, what about jobs to be done? Okay, yeah, jobs to be done has its place. This is a different type of framework and I want us to focus on this for now. The guy in the middle, Don Norman, he's one of the ends of the NNG, the uh, uh, Nielsen Norman group. And Don Norman, good friends with David Kelly, he helped found and you know speaks and teaches at the D school to this day in, in some cases, but uh, he, uh, pretty much, he he coined the term user experience, and he's the pre preeminent expert for user experience as a field. And then the guy in the far right, Jacob Nielsen, he's the other end of NNG. He wrote the preeminent book on web usability. So most of the things we're going to talk about today are based within the research done by these three men and their teams, and their you know they 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 have a long lineage. Um, with all that said. UX is such a new kind of field in general that these three guys are still all acting practitioners, right? Here's some evidence of that. I was actually had the opportunity to get trained by Jacob Nielsen. I like to share this picture because you can see um, I'm a moron and I ruined my one selfie with my hero. So if anyone has advice about not freezing in front of your heroes, you can put that in the chat. Um, but we're gonna use Jacob Nielsen's definition of usability as the framework that we use today too. And I think it's because it's such a good one. So he defines it as five things, learnability. Can, and this is how I think of it, right? This is not how he writes about it, this is how I think. Can users find stuff uh, and learn how it all works? Efficiency, how quickly do users do stuff? This is like time on task, right? Uh, memorability, what a user remembers when they return. Errors, what kind of mistakes are, are user errors are made? And once a user makes an error, can they fix those mistakes? And then satisfaction, how much do users like your design? Now, most of the time when I talk to people, they over-index on the satisfaction one. Many people, when they think about usability, think almost exclusively about satisfaction. So I'm not going to spend too much time on satisfaction today. You can find that most of the time on anyone's, uh, any potential Instagram influencer's uh, Instagram page. So we're not going to focus on that one. We're going to focus on the other four. And that leads me right to the law. So here's my seven laws. So Fitz's law, you've probably heard of this one before. Here's the definition. This definition I think is not very good, the academic definition. So it always confuses people and me. So this is how I think of it. So put stuff as close to the user's cursor as possible and make the most important things bigger. It's very, very simple. So you, you can kind of see the format of this. I'm gonna go through each one, give you the academic definition, my translation and how I use it in my everyday uh, work. The Law of the Magic Pixels. This one has a couple different names. I love this name because it sticks with people better. So we'll just go with that one. Um, this is, that, that, that definition is not too bad. Here's how I think of it. Users look for stuff in the corners and just have an easier time reaching them because they're in the corners. So I wanna take a pause 
these two laws are in total contradiction of one another, right? Put stuff as close to the cursor as possible, put stuff in the corners. So I wanna highlight this. These laws are not meant to be tried and true um, truisms. What they, they blend together. And I put these in a, a really strategic order because when I'm thinking about the law of pixels and I'm thinking about Fitz's law, I think of them in tandem. Right? So I'm going to show you pair law pairings. This is another one of my kind of fast track ideas that I have for simplifying these things. So yeah, you can think, you've seen this pattern a million times on the web. Something really important in the top right hand corner, like a donation link or something like that. Um, or the hamburger icon typically shows up in the top right hand corner of your, your screen on mobile. Um, that's a really great place to put stuff because of the law of the magic pixels. Um, and then Fitz's law says uh, you want to put that stuff closest to uh, the finger. So when you're in the midst of a task, you can think um, UI elements that are, are part of more uh, step-based tasks, not even step-based, but a, a workflow, then those are less likely to be appropriate to be those high touch points that'll be up in the, up in the corners. We'll go over some of real world examples of this. Three, Hicks's law. This is another one of them famous laws. This is how academia talks about it. Here's how I talk about it break stuff into categories and steps when it gets real complicated, you know, like sequences. Um, <laughs> and then law four, progressive disclosure. So this is just show users what they want when they want it, right? So this is kind of like, think of this as just in time. These two laws I love pairing together as well in my brain as I do work. So if you internalize these things, like I don't literally think like, is this a breach of Hicks's law. You know, these are just things you internalize over time. But if you think about breaking stuff into categories, so think about the advent of mega menus on the on uh, in, in um, on the internet now. When you click a, a a link, a mega menu has you you open up in the top navigation bar of a website. You'll click the link. It opens up a menu that has multiple groupings within it. That's a a, a good use of Hicks's law. Um, and then progressive disclosure is the fact that that menu was uh, disclosed under a click, like in the top navigation, that top link. So that would be an example of progressive disclosure. So when you pair these things together, you can make, you think of it as um, uh, a funnel. You want your, you want to get more and more specific as the clicks get deeper, right? So that's a way to think about progressive disclosure and pair that nicely with some Hicks law kind of um, information architecture tactics. And you can get some very powerful um, uh, intuitive uh, workflows in your UX, in your experiences. So here's a great takeaway, right? I see this all the time. Imagine this is a, a top navigation um, bar um, and I put an X by it because this is a breach of progressive disclosure, which imagine this is on a, a large viewport like a desktop. There's no reason to hide the primary navigation under a hamburger on a large desktop, right? So this would be, I would consider a breach of the law of progressive disclosure, um, something like this would be much more usable. The, and why? People ask, well, give me, why is that true? Because you can go to a website and just by reading the top level navigation, get a gist of what can be done on the site. This gives me insight on the entire system, just looking at the top level links, as opposed to a hamburger. No one's coming to your website looking for a hamburger, unless you're McDonald's, I guess. Okay, law five, Miller's law. This one everyone's heard of, right? The seven plus or minus two, by the way, this one is, um, it's being, uh, the, the research on this is, it's, it's really plus or minus, I think like three or four at this point, meaning some people can only hold up to like three things in their working memory at a time. So this is important to, to, to understand. Here's how I think of it. What it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean to only make lists of seven things or less. I've heard so many, this one's misused all the time. I've heard people say, well, there's, you've got too many things in that menu, right? There's people, Miller's law, right? <laughs> seven, you, you got to get hit seven. Anything more than seven is wrong. In fact, there's many ways that you can organize your information on your website in long lists that make it very usable. For instance, um, if you're doing a, you're, you're picking a state uh, in a state picker, you have to like, you, you've done this in a form before, right? What state are you from? A, a good way to organize that is alphabetically. A bad thing would be, to only show seven and make people, I don't even know the alternative. You know, I'm just saying that that's a good example of the information you need being longer than seven um, character, uh, seven items. So here's a, a real world example again. So hiding stuff under that little eye. So this is actually a breach of a couple things, right? We're breaching progressive disclosure. 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't hide critical information. You know, you only want to put stuff progressively disclosed if it does that narrowing down, if it makes sense that you've, you've accommodated some um, of, let's call them personas, someone's task at this point, right? You should never leave anyone hanging to force them to do, make clicks or to make interactions, right? So uh, this is a breach of progressive disclosure as well as make me think, right? So you click in that eight characters, you click into the field and the little thing says re-enter password goes away. So you don't know what that field is for. A much better design would be something like this where the labels are removed from the field. You've got your help test text right there exposed to the user. They don't need to click under the eye, that kind of thing. Law six, we're flying. We, there's only two more, right? Law six, law of affordances as signifiers. This is straight from um, Don Norman's work. He's the one that coined affordances as signifiers. This definition is not too bad. Here's how I think of it. Make stuff look like what it does. It's pretty simple. So if you see on the right there, I've got, it's a rounded rectangle and it's got a slight gradient um, and there's a little bit of drop shadow. You ask 99 out of 100 people what that is, they'll, they'll recognize it as clickable. They'll recognize it as a button, right? That would be the affordance. This, that, what I just described tells you that it's a button. The word up and the up arrow icon, those are signifiers. They indicate what the affordance will do when you click it. So now that, am I saying all buttons need to be red, gradient, drop shadow, rounded rectangles? No, what I'm saying is make stuff look like what it does, right? How many times have you seen, like when the flat design, flat, flat design culture disparaged the web where there was like everything just looked like a flat link like is this a label or a link i don't know you know you need to you, you needed to test it which is just not good so uh now that i tell you this you're going to see this kind of thing in the world a lot if you're if you're insistent on putting icons in your buttons a couple of things about this just this is just a, a side rant um make sure you don't need icons in your buttons right if you're going to put icons make sure there's a label Right, this is the Googleization of the world. Google doesn't do this, and it's terrible. Right, you have to look at the tooltip to understand anything in Google environment. So I get a lot of people argue with me, like, "But Google does it, therefore it's good." It's no, it's not. They have a different. Google has a different um, metric for success when it comes to UX. If you want to make things intuitive and uh, usable, if you insist on putting an icon, make sure that they don't contradict. Right. First, my first recommendation is always a label no matter what. Second, if you add an icon, don't try to get cutesy with it. I see a lot of these things where they try to say, oh, the, the label and the icon blend together to make a new message. And like, oh, our users will, I've heard this a lot of times, the users will learn our icon language. And that's just not true. It's just not true. There's, I won't get into this, but the, there's like eight ubiquitous icons and the rest, no one knows what they are. Um, like down, does down mean download? I don't know, what, anyway. So don't do that. That's just my recommendation there. Just make stuff look like it, what it does. And my rants over about labeling, label your buttons. If you insist on an icon, just make it match your label to reinforce things. Um, there's also accessibility problems with that. Uh, and then law seven, the last one I wanna highlight is Jacob's law. Um, this one's not worded too bad. I think of this as just don't reinvent the wheel. And you can also think of this one as kind of the king law. This one does lay over all the rest of the laws. Now, this one I see misused a lot too, just like the uh, Miller's law, the seven plus or minus two. Jacob's law just says, most people are on other websites than yours most of their time. So why don't you leverage the knowledge they already have coming to your website by matching standardized patterns, right? Here, so, back to the Google example, people say, but Trevor, Google does it like this, Jacob's law. <laughs> I looked up Google, they do it like this, we do it like this, game over, Jacob's law. And I say, no, that's a misinterpretation. Jacob's law says, look at many apps, websites, places that do similar things or, or the same thing as you and find the patterns across. And you will find that Google has its own language, its own set of things. And if you were to look at specifically across the web, you would not find those as ubiquitous patterns, right? So not just one source. If you're gonna abide by Jacob's law, take in multiple sources. Um, and here's a great example. So imagine you have a, um, uh, like a pricing page and there's different options. This is the pro option. So there's a lot of things going on in this poor design. One is we're using a slider. Sliders are 
you they're, they're, they're the control best for showing granular options, not just four. How many times have you used a slider that uses this where it's like, it just pops to the, you know, you get halfway between two items and it pops over. That's a misuse of the control. So it's the wrong control. Um, the control looks a little wacky because it uses some branding, right? There's some kind of like hexagon shape as opposed to like a standard control. Um, and what's the intent? The user here, what if you wanted to, what if you're, you as a consumer wanted to compare, right? You, that's what people are doing on these pages. They're comparing. You want to compare how much terabytes of storage you get in these different options. You have to use a slider to go back and forth. So this is a breach of the plus or minus seven, right? Um, so something like this would be a much better design. And I get a lot of pushback from visual designers that are like, but that's ugly and look how pretty that is. So true, this may be perceived as ugly. This is, tables are harder to, to uh, move to mobile, right? So there has to be some kind of mobile strategy. But when you have the ability to give people what they want, or sorry, to give people what's most appropriate for the task they're doing, um, I recommend doing something more standard like this, like a nice comparison table. And then, I got a couple more little rants. Here's another little rant about the, I did the icon rant. Here's my explicit and relevant, relevant labels. I think if people just thought more about labeling um, from the user's perspective, like just even if you don't even do research, just ask yourself, if I asked hundred people how they would categorize this grouping of things, what would they say? You know, you can come up with a, a better label than, I see lots of, lots of cutesy stuff happening with labels where someone wants a branded thing, you know, like, uh, um, so this, this fake website I made up is called blockchain, B-L-K-C-H. It's a blockchain, a fake blockchain company. So the example I use for this is like B-L-K-L-O-G for like the blog, right? The block log, right? Not only is that a huge accessibility, imagine you're on a screen reader and it's reading it to you. Blah, blah, it's not a word. It makes no sense. And people are scanning for the word blog because Jacob's law, they're looking for the thing they see all the time, right? So they're scanning for that. They see your weirded branded thing and it just doesn't make sense. So make these explicit and relevant and then get, um, then you can get more um, nuance within the content. Here's a great example of labels gone wrong. So this is a mobile screen from an actual company that makes cakes. So you see the message field here. I want you to key in on the message field. That looks like, I don't know, think about any app like Grubhub, right? In the message field, you say dressing on the side, please, you know, or I, I, uh, uh, please don't knock on my door. Just send me a text because, you know, because we live in a non-touch world now. Well, here's what that system really, this is a labeling problem. Here's what that system really meant. That meant the message on the cake. So because this is another breach of, of, uh, of uh, Jacob's law, right? It's like, I've seen this a million times. And what that message means is not what will the message be on your cake. So this is, I don't advocate for long labels, but a much, you wouldn't even have to be thoughtful about this. A much better label that was, could just be something just like the words that'll be on your cake. You know, like that would have been a better label than this. People just, they, they, they overthink it. So anyway, I love that example. And then the last thing, or if, I, if I'm mirrored, so my eighties people, um, f shape reading pattern. This one's not a law, but I like to tell people about it. People don't read your content like a book. It's just not true. What they do is they scan and they scan in kind of like the, sh the shape of a capital letter F, kind of like this. So start in the top left at number one, something catches the user's eye. They read across until they hit number two and realize, oh, there's nothing. This is not what I wanted. They go back to the spine, down to three, rinse and repeat. Now, there are many different reading patterns out there. There's the layer cake. The zigzag, the lawnmower, they all have silly names. But if you just concentrate on the F, uh, it, it's just the idea of scanning, right? So just, you don't need to learn all those and the nuances between all of them, especially for, for your purposes, uh, uh, a UX for non-UXer kind of person, but just always think F shape and you'll be good to go. And here's, I've, how many times have you seen this? This pattern where like picture on the left, call to action, picture on the right, and they, they stripe it. Um, now, this is an example of a blog page from my fake company, Blockchain. And um, I actually wrote like blog articles for this. I don't know. I, I went too deep down the rabbit hole of making my examples seem real. So anyway, um, so this is, I see this pattern all the time. Pretty much every like WordPress template has something like this out of the box. 
And it's really disruptive for usability. It kills the scannability of this. So on a page like this, just like the comparison page, on a page like this, what are people trying to do? They're, they want to find the article. They want to scan through. So just line stuff up. I mean, make a nice standard pattern. This is F-shape pattern in action. All right, and then here's the framework. These are the three-step framework. How, okay, I just told you seven things plus the bonus. How do you integrate that in your, into your work? So first, step one is you wanna check your designs against the laws that we just talked about, right? Pretty simple. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you go through and oh, th there's, there's the downloads, the PDF downloads, that's what they are, that, this is one of them. It gives you this checklist. So you just go through the checklist and you know, just how is my design? This, this is without even talking with users yet. This is just internally when you're making a design, you ask yourself these questions as you go and then check yourself along the way. In the beginning of the project, halfway through towards the end, are, we, are there any obvious breaches of these seven things that have the highest impact? And then guess what? Let's go back to the David Kelly design thinking framework. You're probably already doing something like this. Most major organizations do some kind of process like this. If you are, a lot of pushback I get is like, there's no time or money to do all this additional UX type validation. It, it can fit in your, in your current process, right? So my three-step process here is condensed and it's supposed, I'm trying to make it a low barrier to entry. So this is like minimal viable. Like it, it doesn't cost that much to integrate this in your own practices. So when you do the analyze phase, also do a little bit of this auditing. Step two, prototype your design. Now you can build a simple version um, or you can go like high fidelity, right? But I like, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about a simplified version of the new design based on what I call your educated first best guess. What that is, this is a concept I've come up with is it's an educated guess because you're using the, those uh, seven laws right? But it's, it's still a guess because you haven't talked to users yet. And I'll get into that next. Remember the oath, right? Until I talk with end users. So right there, pro, there's even a stage called prototyping within design thinking framework. That's where you can make your low or high fidelity prototypes. I'm going to um, focus on low fidelity prototypes because of that common pushback I hear. The common pushback, like we don't have enough time or budget to do these kind of things. And what do I mean by low fidelity? It could be as simple as a paper prototype. So a paper prototype is when you just draw different screens of your designs um, out on a piece of paper. So if you tilt your head here, you can see the, this is an example of a paper prototype. Something like this probably cost a designer a matter of hours to make. And then three, I love this quote from Jacob Nielsen. Um, it's important to test users individually and let them solve solve problems on their own. So test your design. This is step three of the process. And guess what? It fits right there under evaluate and then ship it, right? So if you audit against the best practices, and you should do this even in an iterative cycle, even if you've already tested with users, the next go around, always go through that audit process. Uh, do some kind of prototyping, not only so you can look and validate your designs on your own team, but most importantly, so you can test those designs early and often. So if this, we're, we're back to Jacob Nielsen's definition of usability. If this is the definition, how do we test these things? Learnability, you test by watching users execute real world tasks. Efficiency, I think you're gonna see a pattern here. You test by watching users execute real world tasks, but then use a timer, right? Time on task. Memorability, you test users, but you do it over multiple sessions, whether there's a gap of an hour or days, that's how you get some memorability feedback. Errors, same as learnability. You just test by watching users execute real world tasks. And satisfaction, you do the same thing and you ask some follow-up questions. Now there's many more nuanced methods for all of these, but I really wanna focus on the minimal viable here. And what we're talking about is usability testing. And you can easily test use, uh, real end users with your paper prototype. So let me take the paper, paper prototype definition I just told you and add on to it. So draw the different screens of your website on separate sheets of paper and facilitate people executing real world tasks on those pieces of paper. So back to this picture, not only is this an example of 
screens of a paper prototype, it's also a test in progress. So you can see the hand on the left, that's a facilitator. And the participant on the right, it's, they have a pen and they're probably saying something like, they're using that as their cursor. They're saying something like, I would have clicked this button to do that thing you just talked to me about. And then the facilitator would say, okay, by clicking that button, we swap out this paper and we put in that paper. I mean, how low tech can it get? So when I hear this pushback, like we don't have time to build out a fully functioning prototype. It's like, you don't need to just draw on paper. Like this is very valid feedback. I've gotten as valid feedback from paper, paper prototypes as from really like uh, actively working software. So I wanna encourage people to do, do this. And it, it's better to do this than not. So I'd rather, I'd much rather people do this on a low budget, on a low scale, even with just a couple users than to not do it at all because they think there's some barrier for research. And just kind of some last thoughts here about this is low, low fidelity prototyping can unearth 85% of user errors of the people you test. So these things are cheap to do. They're simple to make, you can draw them on paper and they really are easy to administer. Um, I have a whole other talk about a 45 minute talk as well as a two day seminar about how to administer a usability test. But what I did was I took one of the downloads in the, the one of the PDF downloads is my script which is a template. It's my usability script that I use. Um, I encourage you to look that look into that. It'll get you pretty far along the way of running a very valid usability test. Um, uh, you can't find. I haven't found anything like it on the internet. So it's it's most people don't. I don't know. They just haven't distilled it, or they think they're giving away their secrets or whatever. But I told you one of Atten's things is our like teach people to fish type model. That's that's in the vein of that. So I highly encourage you to download that um, script template. It gives some tips, tricks, all kinds of stuff. And then some final thoughts. If I haven't convinced you that like doing basic usability practices is important, um, it, it's important to get over that barrier of like, well, there's not enough time and money or effort. Um, I, I wanna say it from a different angle. If you follow these practices, those seven um, laws plus a bonus, and then follow the three-step framework, you're gonna be knocking out a huge chunk of accessibility. Accessibility is, a large part of it is usability, right? So they, are, they go in tandem. So if, you, if it's not just for the benefit of ease of use, um, if, if you're not sold on the benefits of making things easier to use, this is a way to outwardly show that, um, you know, you care about people who will be using your website in unique ways with augmented technologies, right? This is a way to outwardly show to the world that, by making this usable, I am also achieving some level of accessibility. Um, and, and I just highly recommend that um, if, if you find accessibility daunting, start with usability. And again, you're, you're not the user. So most of the time I'm talking with people and they're just too close to their own projects, um, especially if you're the designer. If you've designed it many times, your gut, I, I found that in my experience, Usability is like 80% intuitive. So most people I talk to in tech, um, they just like agree, like they high five 80% of my recommendations or my, my research or whatever, and, and everyone's happy. But there's that 20% that's counterintuitive. And when you hit that 20%, I really want you to, to think about this fact. Just you're, you're probably too close to it to make a, a good assertion. And the best way is to do the framework I just talked about. Follow the the um, those rules, audit audit for the rules, make your thing based on the rules, and then test the thing. And if you do those three steps, you will avoid many of the pitfalls that I see in the real world. So that's all I have today. I did kind of a condensed version of that to leave some time for Q and A, um, but I'd be happy more than happy to answer any other questions. Um, also, uh, you can reach out to me at any time or anyone at that, and we are a user-centered design firm. So we, everyone is uh, kind of adept at kind of talking about this kind of stuff. Um, so feel free to reach out to them at any time. And that's all I have for today. So Aaron, whew, I'm out of breath. Did I go fast enough? Was that too fast? No, that was awesome. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, also thanks for sharing the slide deck. I posted that to the session page. Lots of useful information. Cool, um, thanks. Yeah, if people just want to ask a question by unmuting, feel free. Or if you want to just add it to the chat, that's fine too. 
Uh, Sally's asking, where can we find the script template again? Oh, I'll, 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 I'll post the link in the chat. Like uh, the webcam, Stanford webcam has a website. And then on that website, this session has a page. And on that page, there's downloads. So let me go there right now. Here, I'll, do that I'll, I'll post that in again. Okay. I love it. Excellent user experience where you can find links to the session in the session on the page on the event. There you go. And Trevor, yeah, I thanks. want to thank you very much for making this session last minute and on Saturday. Really appreciate it. Excellent session. Terrific. Oh, thank I'll you. Send And this might be a stupid question, but typically in the chat, you can copy and paste, but on this one, it's not letting me. Ooh. That's a Zoom setting. I'm, I'm only aware of this because Zoom is now like the way I, I work in general. So, <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, so. Yeah, that copy and paste was to say. I might be able to just in throw, Stanford I, instance. I just throw the PDFs in here, right? Let me try that. I have them here. In front of me. I'm just screenshotting the links right now. <laughs> Here, I'll throw them. I think I can put them right in here. Let me try that. Hey, Trevor, can I ask a couple of questions? Yeah, please. So it's stuff that you didn't really cover per se, mm -hmm. but um, I have a lot of people who want to put related content. So if, if you have a blog article, people want to either put something like a little highlight part way down and it'll you know, either be partway down on the blog itself or in a sidebar or at the bottom or, you know, like what's your take on what's, where's the best place to put that like related content, you know? Yeah. So that's a great question. So first of all, I tried to do the PDF thing. It wouldn't let me. So sorry about that. Um, uh, so, okay. Yeah. Related content. So this is a little thing that most people don't know that I find uh, when through our consulting, you know, um, that it's almost, it's not quite 50-50, but it's almost 50-50. 50% of users, just think of it as 50-50, it's a little skewed, but um, about half of users use primary navigation as the way they, prime, the prime, prime nav bar at the top of a website as their most common way to navigate around the internet, around a site. The other half, I think is less thought of, and they use inline linking, right? So they will use the prime nav, um, but they use it as a last resort. You know, well, actually, footer's the last resort, but second to last resort, it would be the uh, would be the prime nav. So, this is really important. It's really important to understand how your users think about linking um, linking pages together. And it's the use of inline linking is extremely powerful. I think it's kind of out of favor right now because it's kind of old school. People, you know, like people are like, it looks like a wiki page or something. It's like wiki page. Those are great. <laughs> like the fact that you can like. You know, you're, you're looking up, I don't know, whatever, and you find it, it takes you to more related and deeper content. Sometimes that's the best way to navigate Wiki if you don't know the terms. You know what I mean? Same thing with your website. So where do you want to put those? You want to put those kind of just in time. Um, just in time, meaning where you believe the users, and you can test this as well. I, I give another session on um, writing for the web. It's got, it's, I forget, the, it's got one of these titles that it backdoors the reality. It's just how to write properly for the web, but it's called like writing in a responsive world or something like that. So um, you can check that thing out uh, where I talk more about this. And in that, in this framework, I talk about um, conversational writing content in a conversational way. And that's a really easy way to make sure that you hit stuff just in time. So conversational meaning like you actually write like you're talking to somebody. So um, this is really good for use of, uh, of like uh, micro, um, micro copy and stuff like that, like in forms, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So if you put it just in, um, if you put that stuff just in kind of the most appropriate place within the content itself, that's a much more likelihood to be used than if you were to put it like in the right rail, right? We know when you put related links on the right, um, there's this concept called banner blindness. Many users don't even see that. And this is, that's from Jacob's law. You know, the King law is, is, the early internet ruined stuff being on the right side of the screen. <laughs> and that's because that's where the ads used to be. Like, remember the advent of the internet, that's where they put all the blinking stuff and users just, I'll give one quick story about, about that. Um, before I was a consultant with that and I, I worked for, well, I had a couple jobs, but one was I worked for a, a desktop statistical software company that made really hardcore complicated applications. 
And we had this thing where a dialogue would pop up and it was a form and it was really hard to understand. You had to be, these, these were, the, the users were hardcore stat people, right? This is like Lean Six Sigma stuff, right? So they're in there. And um, even when we put help text in appropriate places, users found it difficult to figure out exactly how to fill out the, field, the fields properly in some cases. So we had this concept of having a little help pane that popped out of the side. And the, the way it worked was, this was a failure, by the way, this was in prototyping. Um, they, the users would hover over a field and contextual help would pop up, right? So dialogue, pane right attached to the dialogue, contextual help. Now, when you ran the cursor up and down, like five different fields, the help text over here was going, blah, 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 you know? And many people were like, uh, okay, this, 12, this was, we, we really only had one main product at this company, 12 UXers, um, big UX team, three of them were like PhDs. One guy, you know, these were some top-notch people uh, and um, in the UX world. And, and, and we had a long debate about how, how disruptive that will be for users, right? Some of us were like, yeah, it's not that bad. It's in context, but people are gonna be looking at their cursor. We know this, right? So this blinking is not a big deal. Other people said it'll be so distracting. There was a, there was a continuum. Some people said it will be so distracting that um, you know, users will be flip out and put a hole through the wall or whatever, I forget. Um, we were all wrong. When we tested users, they didn't even see it. So this goes even more, they did not notice that there was a thing. I, I mean, it was right there. It was a, a, like an old school, like Windows 95 dialogue. So it was small and it was just a pain, right? Hanging off the end and they didn't see it. Even though sometimes they move their cursor around and it was blinking just like, just like, so the people that were like, it's gonna blink so much it drives people crazy. When they would demo it, you know, to make their point, they'd just, you know, do some not natural behavior. They'd take the cursor and go, like that was really happening in real life and they didn't even notice it. So I love telling that story because this, this goes to that targeted, like Fitz's law, like people are looking right where their cursor is, right? No one, this is the F-shaped pattern thing too. No one takes, no one like goes like this and says, look at this website. Wow, <laughs> you know, no one's like, look at how, look at how cohesive it is. Look at the story. No, they're trying to do something. And, and, and that's why this stuff was really important. Sorry, I told you it was a rant. I will say the right sidebar, uh, just as a follow-up that uh, we found out that the bounce rates were like, just out, you know, just grew. So people were at, people saw all the stuff on the sidebar. They didn't any, spend time on the article itself and they just clicked right out. So, you know, that's another negative. Don't put all that good stuff over there. <laughs> yeah, and you know, so I've seen effective sidebars. You know what I mean? Like, like that's, why, that's why step one is do the best practice, but step three is test it. You know what I mean? Like, it's not a try and true rule, don't put stuff in the right sidebar. It's just like for beginning users, it's gonna take people a while to figure that out. You know what I mean? So why, why even do it? I say use inline linking for related links. Or even do one of these interrupt, you know, you can do like a nice little interrupt strip that's just like, boom, like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I, I would keep it right in, in line and try to put it, like I said, just in time is, is the trick there. You know, like, well, what if it stays on the side and it's sticky and it's like, eh, they're, it's, they're still not going to look there. <laughs> it doesn't matter how sticky it is. It's Trevor, down. that's, I, that's uh, and Cynthia, you know, that's exactly what our approach is with our, with the, system that we put in place, which is, you know, we don't have a right sidebar anymore. So it, we, we have some ability to do some columns, but in the content area, we just have ability to put inline links either in the, you know, as text uh, linked and within paragraph, but we also have the ability to throw stuff in um, as formatted text or as that's, you know, another stripe or whatever you want to do. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's and, great to hear um, your feedback on that. Um, yeah, the the yeah. research supports that decision. I mean, you know, and, and my anecdotal experience, um, the, the reason I like kind of advocate so hard for usability testing is I've seen it literally change organizations. I, I saw it change a, a multi-billion dollar tech conglomerate. I watched it when I, I was a head researcher for this large tech conglomerate um, before that. And, and, and it was like a backdoor way to get everyone thinking from the user-centered standpoint. You know what I mean? Like it, it worked wonders. It is not the only method but it's one of the most underused, underutilized, misunderstood methods. That's why I talk about it so much because it could literally, trans and it's not hard to do, and it could literally transform the way you do it. And that's how you get the real, you know, the real value. 
But doing that that first step of just making things best practice, it only gets you around 30 some percent there as far as proper usability. It's like, unless you're gonna do a bunch of like multivariate testing, there's so many variables involved that just following the best practices doesn't, it doesn't get you very far. Now it gets you further than the rest of the internet, right? There was a study that just came out that said, it's, it's just hit over 50% of companies um, believe usability is something that's important. So job security, <laughs> right? So we're good. We're, I know we're at time, but do we have time for one more question? <laughs> I'm, I'm good, I can do whatever. Yeah, I think, I think we're fine. Okay, cool. So the law of seven, does that apply to the number of filters? Uh, like, so if you're on a view and you have, you know, you can filter by um, in person or online or something like that, you know, like, does it apply to the law of seven, the number of options that you can choose from, not in that one drop down, but the number of actual things that you want to filter on, like maybe there's a duration, maybe there's a technical skill or, you know, et cetera. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And it's, it's, it's really topical for me because the last two big projects I've done for Ann have been with these huge complicated repositories and how to like, how to use tagging and filtering and uh, uh, faceted search. So tagging, filtering, and faceted search together can be very, very powerful. And no, the answer to your question is absolutely not. You, you can have, I, I mean, the, in those two, pro go to Amazon. There's so many filters uh, there in all of their choices. I mean, the, the, the trick is to group group your filters logically. Oh, you want to break them down into groups. That's the thing. So, so um, and but that group doesn't need to consist of seven things, but you do want to break them down into logical groups and um, make the labels super intuitive. Now I'm talking you know? about the groups themselves. So can you have oh, like, oh, sorry. like more than seven groups and then within the groups, I have a oh. client who wants in within the groups to have like a ton and then nested terms. And I was like, this is like too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's difficult. So what I'd like to do there, I, I just dealt with this. What I like to do there is I like to do, um, I forget what HTML calls it. It's the partially selected state. So old school windows, you can you can use progressive disclosure, right? So close, close use intuitive labels, close those things up like an accordion, or I, I like to think of them as collapsible headers because technically it's not an accordion because I'm a UX dork, so technically. But anyway, so you, you put those labels as uh, collapsible headers, um, and then allow them to check those to just check everything underneath, right? And then the it's, this is good for progressive disclosure because the power users, the ones that need that, will then take the second action, click, open up, and be the people that know the you know that know the nuances, what I want, what I don't want within this section. So that's a, a nice a nice way to break it down. Um, also, what I like about that is it shows you that top level, and it gives people just like the prime nav example I used. It gives people the idea of what they can like sort filter by just by looking at the control, right? So if you use intuitive things, you, you only show them what they need when they need it. Um, it's a really nice way to like, they can understand the system without having to use it a lot. You know, it's, that's, that's the beauty of intuitive. In fact, you know, like people talk about delight a lot. That's like kind of a buzzword that cropped up maybe five years ago. And now it's like, people just talk about delight. And I think it's been, I think it's been really misused. I think people think of delight as like really cool animations. And now the hip thing is like micro animations and like AI predicts what you're about to type. And so it's like, there, the, it's only a delight if, if you know what could be a real delight is if you're looking at, you see the filters there and they're labeled so intuitively that you realize you can find something that you didn't even know existed, right? And you're like, oh, I was looking for that and I didn't even know it. That's delight, you know? So just nice labels are more likely to delight than these micro interactions and these like whiz bangs, you know, woo, off stage navigation craziness. In fact, there's like bad usability in most cases on that stuff. So anyway, sorry, that was another rant. I've got like a handful of like general rants. <laughs> Keep on going, Trevor. There's so much fun, so much I know, fun. I, know. I don't want to be that cranky guy though. <laughs> I have to like, I have to think of how to say all those things positively. <laughs> hey, Trevor, we have two questions in the chat. One's a quick one, wanting to know uh, the correct pronunciation of your last name. Oh, that's actually a really good question too. 
So it's Calibro. And I can say this definitively. So most people say uh, Calabro. And my origin is, I'm like first generation or second generation. And my origin is from a, a little province in Italy. It's on the tip of the boot called Calabria. And it's spelled the exact same way, except instead of the IA, they flipped it with an O. So when my grandfather came over, like literally on the boat, they came over and they're like, let's Americanize this name, drop the I. Where are you from? Calabria, make it an O, right? Anyway, so there's many people kind of where I'm from, which is, I live at, by the way, I'm coming to you from Penn State. I, that's where I live. I live in State College, Pennsylvania. That's where I am now. Um, I mean, like, I can see the football stadium from my living room. Like, I'm, I'm at Penn State. Um, so anyway, I didn't go to Penn State either, which is a whole nother. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of people in this area with that last name. And almost, there's like a weather guy. And he he pronounces it, uh, Cala Cal I can't even say it wrong, Calab Calabro, right? Um, and I was told for years that I was pronouncing it wrong. And even my own family didn't know. And then um, when I was working at this multi-billion dollar tech conglomerate, I had the opportunity to work with a bunch of Italian people. And I, I asked them, I asked this woman from Calabria, like, how is this properly pronounced? And she said it, Calabro. And from that day forward, I was like, aha, this is, we, we were correct the whole time. But a majority of the, pe the people that I've met with that last name in the United States pronounce it wrong. So yeah, like, yeah, I have friends that are like, call a bro. That's a way to remember it, like Calabro. Thanks. Uh, the other question is, how often should you do usability testing when you're on a budget? That's a great question. And here, here's the way I like to think of it. If you have budget to test 15 people, so I'm going to advocate without getting too much in the weeds on this, I'm going to advocate to only ever test five people at a time on a design. So if you have enough budget to test 15 people, you can do, I would advocate to do five at a time in the beginning, iterate on that design off of their feedback do the whole three-step thing again, then test again, and then test again. So three separate tests of, of five people. And that means, like think of it instead of forging a new sword every time, you're sharpening the edge of the sword every time you do it, right? That's because this is all like anecdotal qualitative data. You're not, this is not statistically significant, but when you see the same problem over and over again, you can almost guarantee that other people have that problem as well. And, and the idea is, this is another thing people get confused, like, well, only one of the five people had trouble with that thing, therefore it's not a problem. No, if it crops up as an issue in a usability test, fix it, period. That's that 85% thing, right? You just always fix everything that's that's uh, that you find. Now, if a whole bunch of people have a lot of trouble with the same thing, you can almost guarantee it's a big critical issue to, to fix it. So, 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 the bare minimum, I would say, is five people. I also advocate a test of the test. So maybe test friends and family, like make sure your test is right. But that's a whole side story. But let's just say five. And um, when in the process, it's the second that you have um, a validated, uh, or a, a, you, it's the second you have a prototype worth testing. The earlier, the better. So if you had to choose to do it in the beginning, middle, or end, I would do it. If you only had enough budget to do five people and test once, I would do it early. Because it gives you, it gives you, you get into this code debt, you get into this, all these, all these negative ramifications of making assumptions over time. How many times have I've been, this happened to me a ton. You go into a project and you're like, the longer people look at the design, the more they've, uh, my children are yelling in the background. Sorry if you can, if that's bothersome. It's the, the, uh, the, the joys of working from home. <laughs> so um, uh, I forget what I was saying. So like, like uh, <clears throat> if, I totally lost my train of thought, sorry. If they're, uh, what was I saying? I think you were talking about if you only have five users, test them early. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the longer, you, the longer teams sit with a design or people sit with a design, the more likely they are to be biased, right? That's that you're not the user thing. So test it early so that, so that there's less institutionalized pushback on change, right? This is like the biggest, the biggest problem is that 20% that's not intuitive. Right, so you want to unearth that stuff up front so people can kind of grapple with that. It's like a, I'd say it's a, a way, a political thing because there are multiple stakeholders. There's many ways to skin a cat, right? There's not one right design. There's so many ways, and usability is almost like. Sometimes I feel bad that my role is like always the poo pooer that always just points out issues, right? Like, oh, I don't need to solve it. I just here fix this, that kind of thing. Um, but where there are things, they can always be improved. So the very best designs made by the very best designers, you can still find improvements that lie within those. You know, you can always tweak those things. So, um, so to avoid any of that institutionalized 
um, pushback. And to set the project on the right trajectory early, I say do it in the beginning. But if you can do it beginning, middle, end, that's good. Here's what not to do. Don't just save it to the end as a validation, right? Research is not best to use as solely a validation technique. So I actually don't really like using the word validate because, because of that. I think of it as research, right? So when you're doing it in that, when you do it at the end, no, don't get me wrong. It's good to do it at the end for benchmarking. So then you can prove to people that you're, you made improvements, right? So I say do it there too, you know, if possible. But if you're on a tight budget, bare minimum five people, it can be quick and dirty. Use that template I have in there. The usability testing script template is pretty good. Um, and uh, also last thing about that is um, uh, I really advocate to do task-based, um, like workflow-based uh, test questions on your usability testing, as opposed to um, like, like put them in a, in a real world scenario. Don't try to hit up every single page, right? Have them do some common things. So um, I'll give you a real brief rundown of how I do this. I call it the top task list. You, you, you call out all the critical things, critical meaning this website needs to do this or we've broken a promise uh, uh, bro to the user as an expectation when they land here. Like we sell birdseed for a living, like on our website. If you don't have a button that says, if you don't have the ability to, to buy birdseed, then you've broken a promise. Two, the most common thing. So sometimes you have something like look up careers, you know, uh, like on your website. And you know a lot of because because you work at Stanford, everyone wants to work at Stanford. People are going to that career link all the time, but it's not a promise, but it's but it's used by a lot of people. So you want to include the common things. So critical, common. And then you the third thing you do is you go through and you dedupe a like kind of workflows. So maybe going to the careers page and going through the staff directory are tip, almost the exact same workflow, just on different pages. You can get rid of one of those, whatever one you think represents more. So so you want to keep your test to around 10 to 15 questions. That's a rule of thumb. I've done longer, I've done shorter. It all depends. You don't want to keep people on the line for an hour when you're testing them because the, the data starts to get skewed and you, you um, experience fatigue. So anyway, that was a kind of answer your question and then I answered four different questions, but that's, that's kind of my philosophy on usability testing. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, we're about end of time. So if people want to get off mute and thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.